Hello and welcome to the video. This video is all about flight controllers for fixed wing. I think I've had a lot of questions about this recently because I've just done another iNav build actually using 2.1 with a Radix and a Bixler. I've also updated the flight controller and set it up in a ZOHD orbit wing and I've also put it in a VTEL plane as well. Now that I think is prompted lots of people to uh, to ask questions so this is aimed at all those who are sat there watching it going well hang on a minute there's loads of different options which are the best for fixed wings now i have done a generic flight controller comparison video i do one every summer so the last one that's still current ish was done in summer 2018 i'll put a link so you can go and have a look at that and that talks about flight controllers in a more generic way but even then, I was starting to talk about flight controllers, not as individual omnibus boards or brain FPV boards or beta flight boards or seriously pro boards. It was more about the technology that goes onto them, because in my humble opinion, the hardware for a lot of the boards that we use with beta flight and iNav are pretty much of a muchness. So I don't worry about those as much as I do with fixed wing fixed wing is a little bit more demanding for flight controllers because you have to make sure that the, all the servos are supplied with 5 volts, that any problem with the servo stalling doesn't bring down the 5 volts for the entire system and reboot the flight controller in mid-flight, because that would be bad. But I tend to build lots of models with different flight controllers because I kind of like figuring this stuff out and it makes better instructional videos. There's no point in me making every single video that I do with fixed wing with a Pixhawk because I get questions about iNav, Vector and all those different things as well. So this is a video where I've kind of collated all my thoughts together in one place and hopefully for those of you that are watching this stuff it'll help you understand why I would pick one over the other and where one is better in inverted commas than others in certain instances. Now these are my opinions. Opinions are like belly buttons, everyone has one. Lots of pilots that I know get very worked up about flight controller choices and some of them have had a bad experience so they immediately write off that entire flight controller line as crap. Other people have had a really great experience and then say, oh, this is really good. These is all based on my experiences with the flight controllers. So caveat it with that before you go in. But I do like to think that I've got a reasonable overview because I don't just build with one or two flight controllers. I pretty much go for the whole gamut available in the hobby. So with that said, let's start looking at flight controllers. The first one I'll talk about is the Vector. Now, the Vector and the uh, smaller cousin, the Micro Vector, is really great flight controller that's plug and play. I think it's more aimed at those fixed wing pilots that maybe aren't coming from the multi-rotor side of the hobby. Uh, all of the pins on it are already plugged in. With a big size vector, you don't have to do any soldering at all. You just unplug the cables from your receiver and start plugging them in. You can do all the configuration through the on-screen display. The OSD is a little bit different from others that you may have seen. It uses color, it's vector based, so it isn't a horrible one that we usually have when we're using things like Betaflight and iNav. It does have GPS modes, so you can fly it around, you can do uh, basic mission flying, it's good for return to home, has pitot tube support for airspeed, and it's been going forever. The couple of things you need to think about this is that it does only run on the vector hardware. So the hardware and software kind of go together. It's a closed source system, but that does mean that it's easy to get working. The developers of the software don't have to try and support dozens and dozens of different platforms. It is relatively expensive. It isn't cheap at all, but everything that you get kind of comes in the kit and it does work very well. The other thing you have to be a little bit careful of is the manual for it is fantastic, but it is massive, which is why I ended up making the videos for it. Um, and I actually use the videos myself when I'm putting a new vector in, uh, because reading the manual, it's fabulous. It's really, really detailed. But I know for a lot of people, it just is overwhelming. So it's kind of the different steps. There are some gotchas that you can fall into with the vector, just like everything else. And in my vector series, I do cover them. So I would use a vector in a plane that I'm going to put some pretty expensive camera equipment in. So GoPros and things like that. I'd stick a vector in it just because it's pretty solid. I've had really good experiences with vector and the on-screen display is lovely with the little map and all the other details in it as well. 
Second one I use a lot is the Pixhawk. Now the Pixhawk is something that I've been dealing with for a very long time. The majority of the Pixhawks that you buy these days are clones, so there's a caveat about the quality control around some of those, but they are really cheap and cheerful. But you can also go up to the Pixhawk Cube, which is a very expensive one, and it runs uh, lots of different software. I run Arducopter typically, but there's also Q Ground Control and Mission Planner and loads of other bits. If you're interested in those kind of technologies, I've got lots of Pixhawk series on the channel already that go through the setup. Now again, the Pixhawk is more plug and play, and the wiki for it is very, very good indeed. And the mission flying capabilities of the Pixhawk, along with things like camera control, uh, autonomous flying, surveying, mapping, uh, GNSS support, you know, the high accuracy GPS systems for things like surveying. It's all in there. It's a very, very, very capable system. There are a couple of things that frustrate me a little bit with Pixhawk. The first is that there's very low support for on-screen displays in Pixhawk. That's not really Pixhawk's territory. Uh, the Pixhawk system expects you to use some kind of telemetry radios to send that information back to your uh, screen. In fact, I've done videos in the past where I've had a little Lua script running on the Tyrannus radio and the data has been displayed as almost like a mini mission planner. But most pilots using the Pixhawk these days will have some kind of ground station, uh, some kind of tablet or PC with the telemetry radio on and it will give them all the information about what's happening. So rather than have an FPV as us quadcopter pilots would kind of think of it, it's flown in a slightly different way. Now that's different if you use things like the Arducopter software on standard boards like the Omnibus that we'd use for other systems, but I'll come on to that in a minute. The hardware is expensive. Um, if you're going to buy the real thing like the Pixhawk Cube, uh, the clones are cheap now these days. You can get them pretty much everywhere, but again, you have to be careful with the quality. I don't think there's any kind of QA control with an awful lot of the ones that are set out there. I will use Pixhawk in models where I'm not too bothered about on-screen displays and I'm more interested in maybe having camera control and those kind of things in it instead. The GPS capabilities in the Pixhawk are, in my experience, second to none. And I've got some videos that you can watch that talk about the amazing things you can do in stuff like Mission Planner where you can tell it the information about the aperture and the size of the camera that you're using and tell it the kind of area that you want to fly over and it will automatically figure out what the mission should be uh, even taking into account the overshoots if it's a fixed wing so it can turn around it's fantastic but for everyday use if you want to use on-screen display then it's probably not the one for you. The last one I'll talk about is iNav Flight or iNav. Now this is a derivative of clean flight just like beta flight is but it concentrates more on gps modes and also has far better support than an awful lot of the stuff out there for fixed wing now the cool thing about inav is it is ridiculously cheap it's an open source product you can just download it you don't need to buy any specific hardware to make it work it'll run on pretty industry standard boards now it supports multi-rotors fixed wing planes wings all that goodness the nice thing is is there are flight controllers coming out now specifically made for fixed wing using iNav and those are much better suited because a lot of the boards that seem to be produced these days are built for quadcopters so they only have four outputs and obviously for a wing we're going to have at least five maybe six outputs sometimes seven or eight so we need those additional outputs we also need an awful lot of power potentially to run servos if we're not going to be taking the five volts or six volts to run the servos on the plane from the BEC inside the speed controller that's running the motor at the front or back of the model. The interface, because it's a derivative of clean flight, is very similar to what you've seen in clean flight and beta flight. So there are lots of different things in there, but it's very similar if you're coming from the beta flight world. Good GPS modes, basic mission planning, uh, but the return to home and the loiter and stuff like that is great. So you can kind of launch the wing, get it into a loiter so it's just circling in the air, and then get your goggles down, get comfortable, put it into manual or horizon or angle mode, and then you can go and fly. And then if something nasty happens, you've got a pretty good chance of it doing a return to home and coming back and flying over your head. Good on-screen display support, things like the radar, so as you're flying around, the little H moves to show you which way is back to home, um, height indications, ground speed, efficiency details, so you know how long in the flight you've got. All that goodness is available in iNav, and again, the software is free, the flight controller is going to cost you about 20 quid, 
and the GPS is going to cost you about 20 quid as well. Uh, quid for those in the US is slang for British pound, just like book is slang for dollar. A couple of things to be aware of with iNav. DShot was only recently introduced, so that's a new technology. That hasn't been the focus, but those kind of things are coming along. There's nowhere near as much testing with iNav as the other two. The other two have been around an awful lot longer, so have a little bit more testing on them and lots more pilots flying them. But iNav is a very fast growing project and the developers are very responsive in picking up and addressing any issues that are found. And there are a couple of gotchas that you can fall into. But again, I've done a video that kind of talk about those for setup, because if you're coming from beta flight, there are a couple of tabs that you may try and skip and that won't work very well for you. So now we've talked about the three individual systems. Let me talk about the individual flight controllers or hardware that I use for these systems. What I go for when I'm building a model. And you'll notice that you probably see these things in the videos as they go along. So let's do iNav first. Uh, these days I would recommend going for an F4 or F7 based flight controller. F3, uh, the support in iNav is just being retired as I'm recording this video. So I wouldn't go for an F3 based flight controller if you wanted to keep updating and maintaining your iNav installation with the latest and greatest code. F1 stuff died ages ago. So the kind of things that I like to go for, uh, the Matek F405 wing, I put that in the Kaipaina build that I did last summer. Um, it's quite a big board, it's very beefy, loads and loads of outputs, loads and loads of UARTs. You can plug pretty much everything you want into a 405. The smaller brother is the Matek F411. Uh, that F411 wing is something that I've just installed into my ZOHD Rebel GT. And it's a much smaller version of the 405. Uh, hasn't got anywhere near as many pins and UARTs, but for smaller planes, it's great. And both of those Matek boards are not only the flight controller, but also have all the power distribution pieces on it as well. The other board I quite like is the Furious FPV F35. Um, a little bit more expensive, but then it comes with the GPS airspeed and all the stuff and cables in the package. And that is very much more plug and play. Whereas with the Matex, you are going to have to solder things onto it and pins to plug your servo connectors into. All that stuff is there out the box. So if you want a bit more of a plug and play experience, the Furious FPV F35 is a great choice. More exotic stuff, the Brain FPV Radix is one I've just built out in the iNav 2.1 series and popped it into a Bixler. And that was because Brain FPV have their own vector based on screen display. And as I'm not a fan of the standard OSD that we get in iNav and things like Betaflight, I like that vector based display. It was fun to build with that one. It is a lot more expensive than things like the Matex stuff. But all the Brain FPV stuff that I've used is fantastic and worked really well. And the last choice is I've also built some wings with omnibus flight controllers. There's tons of support in iNav for lots of different boards. If you just look in the wiki, you'll see all the ones that are supported. So there's tons and tons of choice. So you might have a board in your spares bin that you can use for a build. So talking specifically about the Pixhawk Ardu pilot stuff, uh, if we do the Pixhawk bits first and then I'll come back to the open source bit, these days for the best experience, go for a Pixhawk 2.1. Again, it's very expensive, but it is a fantastic flight controller that has redundancy for all of the sensors, even has a little heater inside the cube where the flight controller is to make sure that you don't get any drift due to temperature changes. Then you've got the clone Pixhawks that are kicking around and don't go for an APM. That technology was retired three or four years ago now. In terms of supporting stuff like Arduino pilots, you can still make them work, but I wouldn't go for it now. I'd go for a 32-bit Pixhawk or a Pixhawk 2.1. Ardu Pilot has been ported to more open source boards, the kind of stuff that we've just been talking about for iNav. So you don't have to buy an expensive Pixhawk if you want to try Ardu Pilot out. And if you install it into one of the boards, something like an Omnibus F4 all-in-one board, then you are going to get the benefit and on-screen display as well. Now this is something that I'm probably going to look at over the summer and do some videos on because it's a really exciting part of the hobby. You're getting all of the experience of Ardu Pilot and the fantastic mission planning and capabilities of Ardu Pilot on a very cheap and cheerful flight controller, plus you get the on-screen display pieces too. Last thing to talk about then is Eagle Tree Vector and the Vector and the Eagle Tree system obviously go together hand in hand. So to run it, you're going to have to buy the Vector. Again, it's quite expensive. So you only really have the choices of the full size Vector and the Micro Vector as well.
So hopefully that's interesting and it helps explain a little bit about my thoughts and what I do with iNav, the Vector and the Pixhawk and also the RD Pilot system. For me, it comes down to space, how much money I want to spend and how much money is in the craft. The Vector is great if you're a new pilot and you just want plug and play, but it's quite expensive. The Pixhawk is amazing if you want bulletproof GPS modes and fantastic surveying and mission planning, but the best flight controllers in the Pixhawk family are very expensive. But again, stay tuned, make sure you're subscribed because I'm going to be coming around and looking at RD Pilot on £20 flight controllers in the summer. And then you have iNav, which is an open source project developing very quickly and does a really good job of providing fantastic GPS flight modes on both fixed wing and multi rotor craft. So all the series for builds of these are available on the channel. Have a look in the playlist and I take you through each of the individual steps to set it up. But hopefully that context will give you an idea of which one is probably better for you. Thanks for watching the video and watching right to the very end. You can find me in all the usual places on social media. And if you like the video and like what I'm doing here, then hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification icon too. If you really like what I'm doing, you can go the extra mile and become one of my Patreons for access to me directly for support and also giveaways and regular updates too. If you're looking for particular content, then check out the playlist. I organize all of my videos into playlists. So if you're looking for a particular topic, you can find everything here. If it's called Introduction To, it's designed to start very simply and build on that simple introduction to teach you all about it. If it's called For Beginners, then that is really aimed at people who are brand new to that part of the hobby. You can also search on YouTube for anything that you're interested in using the search function at the top. So iNav Painless 360 will find all of my videos and even the playlists around iNav. So thanks again for watching and happy flying.